Well, first, happy Easter, um, everyone. Whatever Easter means for you. Easter is one of those two days, along with Christmas, where people who don't even go to church feel they ought to go to church. Easter is possibly the most awkward feast day that Unitarians have inherited from the old liturgical calendar, awkward for any rational theology. A Christmas is easier. After all, a birth is a matter of historical fact, but a resurrection from the dead. And more, a resurrection from the dead that is meant to foreshadow the physical resurrection of everybody, all of us, with bright, shiny, new spiritual bodies when the final trumpet shall sound. Of all the stories in the New Testament, this surprise ending of the Gospels, this Hollywood blockbuster ending, was uh, kind of like pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Think you could kill the Son of God? Think again. I always felt that even as a Catholic, that this ending went a bit too far, asked a little too much from the audience. But I discovered later, it's probably apocryphal anyway. Based on stylistic differences between the resurrection story and the other chapters in Mark's gospel, the first gospel, written about 60 to 70 AD, the resurrection story seems to have been tacked on, written by somebody else after the fact. It's either an editorial fix by the other gospel writers or one that the other gospel writers copied, and thus the resurrection story became the common story of all the gospels and folded into a legend that served to enthrall and mystify generations of believers to come. Christmas, the birth of Jesus, is a matter of fact, historical fact. Resurrection, however, is a fiction and asks far too much of rational beings. Every life, as we know, ends inexorably, inevitably, in death, final, finito, and the dead don't get up again. And pulling the rabbit Jesus out of the hat of the sepulcher wasn't necessary anyway. Uh, do we need uh, to believe that a mysterious suspension of the immutable laws of nature make Jesus' life any more worthy of veneration, any more worthy of our aspiration than the way he lived? To pull this conjurer's trick, aha, you see, he's not really dead at all is to miss the whole point of his continuing relevance. If he's God, and therefore unkillable, I can't really expect to aspire to his example. If he's human, well, maybe I can. Jesus himself never really offered a bodily resurrection. It, it's a metaphor for a spiritual resurrection, the entering of the kingdom of God, as he frequently said, which is within you. So if we were to lop off this cheap conjurer's trick, this rabbit out of the hat from the Gospels, Jesus still lives, not in heaven at the right hand of God. He lives right here and now, but he lives in another sense. I mean, friends, if there's one day that reminds us that religion is largely a matter of what metaphors you use, this is it. The way in which Jesus lives right now is the way we all may live after we die, not actually risen, but transformed. Easter abounds in figurative language, metaphors and symbols, expressing a greater than us mystery of new life emerging, new life reborn and transformed, tireless, unending, ongoing, unbounded, and unboundable life. I didn't know what Coralie was going to write before today, but Eggs feature rather prominently in this. I mean, think of an egg. At Easter, an egg betokens not breakfast, but the potential life of the bird within. Like Jesus in the tomb, hidden, latent, potential, unseen, but there. Think of the Easter bunny, the rabbit itself, the rabbit out of the hat. The rabbit is, as you know, the most procreative of creatures. If you have ever bought some for the kitties, you know this. You buy a couple and lo, you wake up and I shall show you a mystery. There are a hundred of the furry little beggars. The life force, latent, unseen, hidden in these furry little critters cannot help 
but burst forth. I also recall that lilies, lilies were a common Easter iconography when I was a kid, and for a long time that baffled me. They were usually associated with death, funerary rites, grave sites, and many of the funeral homes in my town, I, I noticed, used lilies to adorn their logos. But it's a symbol too. I, I was only really, I only really got how that fit Easter when I bought a farm here off of Maine's water with a septic tank. I began to understand how lilies fit the resurrection idea. It's not just that they're a tuber that seem to die and seem to be reborn every year. It's that they do particularly well where decay is most prevalent. Septic outflows where the grass is always greener. Bogs, marshes, beautiful living things springing again and again from the sites of profoundest decay. Lilies betoken life from death. Just as in the Easter story, God dies, God hides for a while, God is reborn. And these symbols, the egg, the bunny, the lilies, these metaphors express the same mystery, the interdependency of life with death in the process of transforming the natural world, rebirthing it into the ever new. Nothing abides. All things flow, says Lucretius. The tang of pathos in this is that nothing is reborn exactly as it was before. Things change. Today's reading, Transformations, reminds us of this. Jesus, too, was transformed, if you recall. His risen presence in the Gospels was more ghostly. He appeared and disappeared seemingly out of nowhere, unannounced, and finally ascended into heaven. No longer simply a physical presence, he became kind of the apostle's idea of him, which could pop up, as ideas do, and as quickly vanish, as ideas do, and perhaps just as some ideas do, ascend to heaven. So when someone stops you on the street corner or comes to your door to remind you that Jesus lives, you can say, amen, brother. He, you're right, in a sense. The person of Jesus is gone, but he lives, transformed into myth and moral. And notwithstanding the current fashion of atheism, God himself is not dead, cannot die, for how can a fiction die? Since the dawn of history, mankind has anthropomorphized the notion of God, that is, understood him in exclusively human terms, which by definition are incompatible with a being, God, without parts and without limits. And of course, thinking of God in this human, literal way makes theistic religions easy targets for the mockery of atheists because it is absurd to think of God as a kind of human. Why have we always done this? Anthropomorphizing God, or indeed anything unknowable, fictionalizing it, that's just the default setting of our brains. It's a species, for those of you who are interested, of inductive reasoning, whereby we reason about some lesser-known concept, like God, based on a known concept like man. The Greek philosopher Xenophanes coined the term anthropomorphism, saying, Ethiopians say their gods are flat-nosed and dark. Thracians say theirs are blue-eyed and red-haired. If they had hands and could draw, horses would draw the shapes of gods to look like horses and oxen to look like oxen, and each would make gods' bodies have the same shapes as they themselves had. I prefer the old Yiddish proverb, which has it that if triangles had gods, those gods would be three-sided. <laughs>